The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Today is Wednesday, May 11th. I'm Donna Will, Professional Development Coordinator for the Developmental Disabilities Administration. We welcome you to the, the Maryland Community of Practice for Supporting Families webinar series. The title of our webinar today is Self-Direction, Living Your Best Life. This session is being facilitated by Mary Ann Kane Bresci, Parent and Director of Family Supports for DDA. Her special guests include Samantha Davis, Self-Direction Participant and Business Owner. Also, Al Wopat, Self-Direction Participant and Alicia Wopat, Family Member and Member of the Self-Directed Advocacy Network, also known as SDAN of Maryland. Um, we also have Monique Prestiani. She's a service coordinator or CCS with um, Service Coordination Inc. We also have Babette Smith, a parent support broker with International Supports LLC. And she's also a master trainer for Expectations Matter, which is uh, my life, my choice, my plan. Um, charting the Life Course Ambassador and a member of Maryland's Self Direction Learning Collaborative. We also have Christy Coolbreath. She's the statewide coordinator of self-directed services for DBA. Anyway, before we begin, I'd like to go over a few things about the webinar. All participants are in listen-only mode. Um, there are two options for listening to the webinar by computer and phone. If you have trouble hearing, you can try switching by clicking on the appropriate button in the webinar panel on your right. So we have one handout for the webinar. You can find it in the handout section in the panel to your right. And they can also be emailed if you are listening by phone. We are recording the webinar and we will post that on the DDA website and YouTube. We like to hear from you to get your feedback on today's presentation and any suggestions you might have for future topics. Please use the question or chat box to the right um, in the webinar panel to provide it. If you have questions related to your family members' services, please contact your local regional office. Okay, I'd like to introduce Mary Ann Kane Bresci, but oh, before that, right, we're going to do yeah, um, yeah, yeah. poems. So we're going to yeah. find out a little bit about you. So we're going to um, ask, where do you live? <clears throat> it's not real specific. Um, it's basically the regions. Okay, we're going to give it a few more seconds. Looks like most of you have um, responded. Um, all right, we're going to close the poll and share. So, okay, it looks like 36% um, uh, said that they were in the central region. 11% um, said the eastern region. 43% uh, said southern. And 9% said western. So thank you for that. We're going to hide that. And now we're going to share a new poll. Okay, what is your relationship to disability? We're having great participation in this um, poll. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to close it and um, share it. Um, looks like 50% um, are family members here today. 14% are coordinators of community services, also known as CCSs. Um, we have 18% who uh, represent DDA providers and, and another 18% who said other. Um, so thank you for participating in that poll. And I'm going to turn it over to Mary Ann. Thank you, Donna, and um, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Um, to our um, webinar on, on self-direction, living your best life. The purpose of um, the webinar series in general is to bring individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, families and others together to connect and share information as well as ideas, all in an effort to support one another as we move through, um, well, it's initially got started due to the, the pandemic, but we want to move through the pandemic and beyond. Through this webinar series, we've discussed and addressed a variety of topics and concerns 
individuals and families face related to COVID, but also just everyday life. And we, we do this with our invited guests and subject matter experts, and always through the lens of charting the life course. What, what, is the, what is charting the life course? It is a set of universal principles and tools. Its fundamental principle states that all people have the right to live, love, learn, work, play, and pursue their aspirations in the community. Charting a Life course was developed by the University of Missouri, Kansas City's Institute for Human Development Family to Family Program. And it was developed to help people with developmental disabilities and families create a vision for a good life. Think about what they're going to need to know and do, navigate, and in some cases, develop the sort of supports and resources they'll need. And finally, in general, just truly to discover what it's gonna to take to live the lives of their choosing and do it. At the core, charting a life course, at its core, I'm sorry, charting a life course, use the person within the context of family, however family is defined, but they review it within the, they view it within the context of family and community. Today, we're discussing self-direction and how it can help children and adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families live their life live their good life. And to help us do this, we have an amazing panel of, of, of guests here. As, I'm sorry, I drew a blank. Um, as Donna previously, sta previously stated, we have Samantha Davis. And Sam, Sam, if you can raise your hand and just wave your hand, that would be great. Who is a self-direction participant and business owner. We have Al Wopat. If you're on with us, Al, please wave your hand. And um, his mom, Alicia Wilpott, um, who is a family member and is with Self-Directed Advocacy Network, otherwise known as SDAN. We have Monique Cresciani, a service coordinator or CCS with service coordination. Babette Smith, who is a parent and support broker with Intentional Supports, LCC. Um, and in addition, the Master Trainer for Expectations Matter. She's a member of Maryland Self-Direction Learning Collaborative. And, and then finally, we have Christy Colbreth, who is our statewide coordinator of self-directed services with DDA. So we have a tremendous amount of experience here and expertise, and we're just so excited to be able to share um, all of this with you today. So I'd like to get started. We're gonna begin with Sam. Sam, uh, my first question to you is, how does self-direction help you to live your best life? I've been in self-direction for five years now. The first two years, I focused on community living activities while I was developing my baking skills. But I really wanted to start my own baking business. So three years ago, we changed from community activities to start my own business called The Cupcake Queen. The Cupcake Queen is a cottage farm business that operates out of my home kitchen, as you can see in the background here. You can follow me on Facebook and or Instagram. I love self-direction because it allows me to do what I want on my own schedule. And it lets me be very independent and I live the life that I want. I also participate in many other activities, like I volunteer at the local library, I participate in 5K races, I'm a lector at my church, I perform in Shakespeare plays, and self-direction gives me the freedom to be my myself, my full okay. self. Can you, Sam, can you tell us how self-direction specifically helps you to run um, or support you in your business? Self-direction gives me the freedom to have the people I need around me who can best help me with my business. Right now, I have one employee because I can do all the planning, the chopping, and the baking. And my employee helps me with the paperwork and the marketing and sometimes with the deliveries. As my business grows, self-direction is good to have in case I need more support or new employees. That's for instance, I, for right. instance, right now, I'm looking into hiring a professional cake decorator who can give me some pointers, lessons, because I have three weddings this year coming up for orders. 
and self-direction will allow me to do that. Okay. Well, let me ask you this then. Um, this is fantastic. Let me ask you, do you, do you feel that <clears throat> self-direction really enables you or gives you the best choice of employees because you do in fact self-direct? Yes. Um, in the beginning, it made sense to hire my mom who is here with us today because she knows me well and supports me the best. And she also has the flexibility in her schedule at, to work with me when I need it. Terrific. Well, this what a great story you have, Samantha, and thank you for sharing that with us. You're welcome. With that, um, so with that, what I'd like to do is to to move on to um, Alicia and Al. And Alicia, if you could um, talk to us and um, describe how self direction helps you to support Al to live his best life, and and please just let me know when you want me to advance this slide. Thank you. Absolutely, I will. So, um, my name is Alicia Wopat. I am the proud mother of a 28 year old uh, son with autism who self directs. This is his, I guess we're almost finishing his sixth year. Um, I decided to show you some photographs um, to just kind of make it real. Um, my son is minimally verbal um, and is not um, a meeting lover. Um, he doesn't really like being talked about, and he's not very good at um, um, communicating details in this kind of a forum. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how he is really good at communicating in a bit. Um, but this this is just one way um, somebody with a little more uh, who needs a little more supports um, self directs um, Al. Um, Self-direction has been an amazing thing for my son. Um, such a change from school, such a, a wonderful change from school. Um, it's growth, uh, new discoveries. Um, and of course, you know from photos, I'm showing you um, the, the happiest of moments at the B&O train museum, um, out on trails, um, Doing, you know, doing really what he likes to do, which is um, he's very much of a foodie. So we, uh, during pandemic times, and even still, we do a lot of curbside pickup and a lot of hiking outside. Um, so this kind of gives you a little bit of a glimpse. There's a picture of him and me and a picture of him and his staff, but mostly it's him just kind of enjoying the community um, and his world. And so just wanted to give you a little glimpse into what it really looks like before I talk to you about how, it, how we got there. Okay. So, um, I guess next slide. Sure. So the hallmark of self-direction is choice and control and flexibility. Um, I don't want to get into too many details, but self-direction gives you the budget authority. So some flexibility about how you spend your funds and the employer authority, which is flexibility on, on who the participant, who my son hires. So, Flexibility and choice has to do with what you do, when you do it, um, who you do it with, where you go, all within, um, obviously, uh, Centers for Medicaid Services and DD, Maryland DDA's rules. But um, for us, it was an amazing change from school. Um, it allowed him to choose, especially the time of day. So he's not a morning person, so we don't start bright and early. Um, he decides when he's when he's ready to go, when he's ready to, when he wants to stay home, he can stay home and do activities here. When he wants to go places, he goes places. And he pretty much directs how each individual day goes. He's not much of a, a advanced scheduler. He likes to fly by the seat of his pants, sort of. So um, I also wanted to tell you, and it, uh, as Donna and Mary Ann mentioned, um, I am very involved with the Self-Direction Advocacy Network of Maryland. Um, we are the advocacy group in Maryland for people who self-direct. And I welcome you all to join our mailing list, um, but also to take a look at two videos we produced. One is, uh, so you get a glimpse into many more people's life on how they, how they see their good life. And um, another video on uh, direct support professionals and the relationships between people who self-direct and and their staffs. So um, 
I think the, the next slide. Um, so I think it's sort of clear to, by Marianne's uh, introduction, that the person is primary. The person who self-directs their service is um, the person who's in charge. Um, as Stan believes, I believe personally, everybody has the ability to self-direct with the right supports. And it's how we support those who, who need it that, um, that is the most important piece of, of what a family member can do. Um, people who are, there are people who are more verbal and less verbal, people who communicate by eye gazes, people who like to recall things looking through pictures, um, and teams can get together and decide um, with their knowledge of an individual how, how best to enhance the communication between the person and the people that support them, uh, how to advance um, their, their life goals, really. Um, so, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about one of the most important pieces of self-direction and support, um, what I call the team. So I think we can do the next slide. Sure thing. So a team is, um, the, in my way of viewing it, the person that, um, the person selects a group of people. It can be a small group or a larger group of people who help them get to where they wanna go. Uh, help them design their days, help them um, figure out what their goals might be, uh, help them figure out how to get there. So team members should be freely chosen by the person. They can be family members, friends, guardians. They can be their staff. Um, must, absolutely must have the person as the primary head of the team. Must absolutely have a CCS, a Coordinator of Community Service, who is basically the liaison between the person and DDA. Um, and in self-direction, and this is a personal opinion, I feel it's really very helpful to have a support broker um, who is able to help the person um, with some of the human resources pieces, uh, locating various um, supports and resources in their community, and a host of other things. So individual members of a team um, can provide different perspectives, um, knowledge about their interactions with the person, um, what to avoid, what things make somebody happy, um, what has changed. You know, people's desires and choices change over time and um, people can help uh, the support their team member, their, their person um, by problem solving, uh, by op offering new ideas and really sometimes just by listening to what the person is communicating. Um, Teams need to communicate with each other, uh, but predominantly take direction from the from the person. Um, there is there is great there can be great interaction between members of a team. Um, I can uh, tell you one thing that's been going on here. We started uh, working with Al to help him uh, communicate, and one of the things that seems to have worked the best is texting. Um, and one of our team members. One of his staff has been going through, has gotten his master's degree and um, was starting to talk to him about thinking about the whispers we all tell ourselves. And um, for whatever reason, we've tried a hundred different things and this seemed to click. And all of a sudden I've gotten one or two sporadic texts that tell me exactly what he's thinking and what he wants. So we have just gotten a glimpse into uh, this amazing potential, um, and and it is going to be you know the primary uh, goal of his next year because the more someone's able to communicate, the more you relieve their frustration and anxiety, um, and obviously the more they're going to be able to uh, get into the community. So I just wanted to give you a little personal um, glimpse into some of the amazing things that can happen when team members um, work together to um, achieve the person's goals. So I think next and last slide. What? No? Oh, my goodness. I, I was just gonna talk a little bit about DSPs, I think. Yes, please do. I, um, I'm i sorry somehow that slide got deleted. I apologize. Okay, no worries. Um, so I just wanted to say, and I guess what I just said before kind of leads into this. 
a uh, person gets to choose, so employer authority, person gets to choose who they wish to hire. They are the employer. Um, and the DSPs, direct support professionals, staff can come from a whole host of people. Um, Al's initial staff came from him uh, from school. And um, we've hired all different people from all different places. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people find their best staff from uh, the activities that they like to do. Uh, somebody liked to do climbing and they found uh, a staff member who really wanted to you know, be a part of the team who was a really good climber and was an excellent fit. So the high, people you hire, the people who are on your team, um, very personal, very unique, um, and um, can be an amazingly wonderful thing. Um, these days, it is harder and hard, it is hard to find um, direct support professionals, hard for providers, hard for self-direction. But um, but I think you know we're able to look in very unique spots in places where um, people have interests and um, and create very unique, very very person-centered um, situations plans staff um, and and very unique ways to spend um, the allocated um, funds. So I highly encourage um, people to take a really deep, deep look into it to see if it's right for you. Um, and um, self-direction, I know, has got some people feel that it's more difficult than um, the other option, which is a provider option. But um, there's positives and negatives to, to whichever way you go. Um, and I would highly recommend, um, you know, talking to a bunch of people who self-direct and a bunch of people who are in providers to see really what's going to fit um, the individual person. So um, thank you guys for listening and um, I'll be here if there's any questions I can answer at the end. Terrific. Alicia, thank you. Um, and thank you for bringing up the, the role of the CCS and the support broker. And we're going to get to those two folks in just a moment. But before we do, I, I just a comment. Um, I just, um, and, and something that Sam said too, both of you, is self-direction really, it, it, it's, it seems to me, really facilitates the, the growth of the individual um, uh, because you're supporting them truly in the way in which they need to be supported and supported by folks who really can speak to whatever those needs might be. And, and, the result, and a result of that is that you do see growth and, and sometimes, um, we forget that, right? We can forget all about that or we don't expect it, but it's there. And, and so to me, this is, provides a lot of hope. So thank you, thank you very much. And with that, um, we're gonna talk about um, the roles and responsibilities of, the, of our coordinators of community supports. Uh, sir, I'm sorry, coordinators of community services. And with us, we have Monique Prestiani with um, um, service coordination. And Monique, welcome. Hello. Thank you. Hi. Um, can you just talk about, yeah, can you talk about this? <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, before I, I jump into kind of what I had prepared, I just wanted to piggyback on something Alicia said about finding your direct um, support professionals kind of anywhere. Um, when I first started to really become passionate about this field way back in 1999, I was working as a lifeguard at a pool and I just established this really cool connection with these two young men who were diagnosed with autism. And I started talking to their mom and she ran a program from their home. And that's kind of um, the point that really shifted my focus and my change and my, um, the direction in my life. And so, you know, I was just, I was a lifeguard. I wasn't a trained professional at that point in time. Um, you know, I, I had worked with some individuals with special needs prior to that, but nothing uh, to the extent of what I ended up making my career into. And so you can really find somebody anywhere. And that um, is really one of the glorious things about self-directed services is that you can connect with somebody and be able to have them as your staff or support you in some kind of paid or non-paid way. Uh, when you self-direct your services that you may not always get through a provider. You know, those connections um, that the provider may not have a position that that, that works for the, the person that you really connect with. And so, so that is an advantage of self-direction. 
Um, and I kind of talk about that a little bit later, but so then kind of jumping back into to why I'm here uh, as the service coordinator, we have many roles in supporting anybody that we serve, whether they choose self-direction or traditional. And so there are things that overlap, you know, when we support somebody who is uh, using traditional services that are through a provider or for self-direction. Um, and in those, we support a person to write their annual person-centered plan. We help them to identify whether self-direction or traditional is best for them. We kind of talk about the pros and cons, the advantages of each service, the um, the challenges with each direction, you know, whether it's traditional or self-directed. And then if somebody chooses self-direction, we help them to understand all of the DDA required documents, which is just, it's it, it's a growing list now. The, the self-direction model has changed really over the past uh, like year and a half. Um, and some of the changes are really, truly fantastic. It gives a person a lot more control with their budget and options. Um, but there are some, you know, some, some forms that go along with that. And the forms are very valuable for helping to decide how the team is directed and managed and how time is spent, um, but they can be confusing. And so a coordinator will help somebody to understand the purpose of those forms, help them fill them out um, and help to support that process. And then that coincides with the annual plan. Those forms tend to get submitted annually with the plan. Um, unless there's a change or an update, there are some forms that need to be updated regularly or if there are changes in staff and things like that, that those forms are updated. But that's where your coordinator comes in. Um, an individual doesn't have to remember all of that all the time. The coordinator helps them to facilitate all those changes and make sure all those forms are up to date. Um, we will also help you to understand the reasonable and customary pay rates for uh, staff that you can hire. So for every position that you hire, DDA sets a guideline on how much you can pay a staff or a vendor. And so we'll help you understand those reasonable and customary rates. We'll help you get your budget situa situated based on the amount that DDA says you can spend and then how much you're going to pay your staff. Uh, what benefits you may offer, um, whether it's health insurance, personal time off, mileage reimbursement training, kind of whatever you feel that you want to offer an employee, that's all your choice. And we help you to figure out how to fit that into your budget. Um, we collaborate with you to determine what services best suit your good life. You know, so it's not about fitting a service to you. It's about um or fitting you to a service i said that backwards it's not yeah. about fitting yeah. you to a service yeah. <laughs> um it's about you know seeing what you want to do with your life and sam you have a really great example of having to want to start your own business and do your own baking mm -hmm. and um and you're really able to customize services for that for that level of support that you need for whatever it is and as it changes throughout your growth um and so, you know, for Sam's Good Life, we can really help her with those services um, and really figure out how often she needs them, exactly what services match what she wants to do and help that to be part of the plan. And so we will help to figure out what whatever services are needed instead of, um, you know, we work forward from the person to the service instead of backwards from the service to the person. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then some services do come with limits. So, um, so for example, like personal supports has an 82 hour a week limit. Um, meaningful day services have a 40 hour a week and eight hour per day limit. So we will help the individual to understand the limits for any services that they may pick. That's either a daily, um, a daily limitation, weekly, monthly, annual, kind of whatever the, the limit is, will help to make sure they stay within that limit. Um, if they choose to have a vendor, as opposed to hiring staff directly, maybe they want to use a vendor for services. A lot of popular vendored services are nursing supports and support brokers. They're often through vendors, um, as opposed to staff that the person's hiring directly to work for them. Um, vendors, can also be uh, community development services. There are some providers who offer um, 
a person the ability to still participate within their group, but uh, self-direct that so then they have a vendor agreement in order to make that happen. Um, we're still going to complete quarterly visits and monitoring um, that we would do for traditional or self-directed. Um, self-directed, in my personal experience, we tend to see um, more often just because um, some, there can be just a lot more activity. Um, but I, I also have a very heavy self-directed support um, load. So, so that may not be the, the trend for all uh, service coordinators. Um, we'll also help to document progress for outcomes. Um, documentation for that progress is really huge. You know, we set, we write that um, service implementation plan with a person-centered plan to say, you know, how a person's going to achieve their goals. And so then we want to make sure DDA knows how the person's achieving their goals and how self-direction is helping them to do that. So we help to document those goals through our um, computer system called LTSS. Um, we also help with making sure the person's medical assistance stays active and that their DDA waiver is active. We can help with any redetermination or eligibility uh, when that's needed. Um, we're going to monitor the monthly, the budget by the monthly statements that are sent out. And so that uh, financial management service will send out monthly statements. Um, the team monitors that, but the coordinator does too. And so if there's anything that's kind of out of the ordinary, the coordinator may communicate with the team and say, hey, this is looking a little bit either overspent, underutilized, or it looks a little bit different. You know, was there a change? And so just kind of reach out and make sure everything is still um, going on as needed sometimes people's lives change and you have to use your, maybe your personal supports more often than you were before. And so that's where the coordinator will reach out and say, hey, it looks like this is being used a lot more. Um, are there long-term changes that are needed or was this something short-term so that we can make sure that the plan and the budget really addresses the needs for the person? Next slide, please. Um, and there are a lot of people that can help. So um, I think that Sam and Alicia talked about some of these individuals, the support broker, um, and there can also be a designated representative, which is a non-paid person that acts like sort of like a support broker. Um, you can have your whole person center plan team. You can have nurses, um, family, friends. Um, if you're involved in a, a church and you want somebody from your church to be part of your team, um, it's really completely up to you who you want to help you direct your services. Um, and then some of the benefits, I think that Sam and Alicia really did a great job of talking about the benefits of self-direction um, and about how much control they have, because that really is, I think, one of the main highlights that you get to really control your services. You you hire and train your own staff. You tell them exactly when you want them to work. Um, to Alicia's point about her son, Al, he's not a morning person. Most traditional day services it start, you know, they have like an eight to three schedule. And if somebody doesn't want to wake up at eight o'clock, then attending a traditional day service through a provider can be tough. If they want to start their day at noon, you know, the self-directed model really gives them that benefit and that, that flexibility to say, hey, I'm going to start my day at noon and my staff is going to come in at noon and that's that's what I want to do. And so they really have the freedom to have their schedule be whatever it is that they want it to be. Um, services are typically just kind of by default one on one, um, which is a huge benefit because you're not sharing the attention of the staff. You're really able to focus on exactly what you do, you know, for Sam, let's say she went to a traditional day program and she was baking with a group of three or four other people, you know, she may not have a lot of that individualized attention to focus on what she needs to do to improve her baking, whereas if she's one on one with her staff, she's got all the attention to the staff and she can she knows exactly what she needs to learn to, uh, to, to you know, make a new recipe or something. Um, and and she's going to learn that because she's got her one on one staff and she's going to learn it quicker, um, possibly than she might in a group. Um, and and so I think that that is just some of the benefits that I've seen and observed for people that I've supported. Um, 
and I, I love the examples that we've had here today. And, and I think that's, that's everything that I have to share. Well, terrific, well, Samantha. Terrific, this Samantha. information is incredibly useful. And I just want to remind folks, attendees, to please, if you have questions, to put them in the chat box. And I also want to remind you that today's webinar um, last, goes until 1.30. Um, so I just wanted to remind you of that. So with that, let's move on. And again, thank you, Samantha. So I mean, Monique, thank you so much. All right, let's move on to self direct um, onto the support broker and the roles and responsibilities of the support broker. And with that, we have Babette Smith here to talk to us about this. Thank talk you, Marianne. Sure. The role of the support broker, I feel, is just remarkable in helping an individual in self directed services. Um, we are a coach, a mentor, an assistant, and most importantly, a team member. So we encompass a lot of roles. Next slide, please. Sure. So how can a support broker help you when you're in self-directed services? There are so many aspects of being an employer. And when you get in self-directed services, it's essentially you become the employer. A support broker can help you learn about your responsibilities as an employer. There are certain things that you need to do. They can help you with interviewing, hiring and firing your staff with scheduling your employees. They can help you develop communication logs. They can help you find different ways to evaluate employees. They can help you with timesheets, budget tracking, and they can also help you with resources. And I do wanna note though that support brokers do not sign or approve timesheets or make any decisions for you. So you need to remember that. Next slide, please. So under the employer responsibilities, there are a lot involved with that. You have to worry about fraud prevention, you want to make sure you know what employee records have to be kept. You want to learn about confidentiality, maintaining a safe work environment. So and a support broker can help you learn about these. They're going to teach you what fraud is and how to make sure none of your employees or you are committing it. They're going to let you know what employee records you have to keep, how you need to maintain confidentiality. You don't want to be talking about your employees um, and you want to make sure that your, your work environment is safe. Next slide. So one of the first steps you have when you're hired as a support broker, which it, you can be paid or unpaid, and it is a hired position. So to be a support broker, you are going to be interviewed. So after it's determined that someone wants you to be their support broker, one of the first things you're gonna help them with is interviewing and hiring their other staff. So you, where do you find staff? How do you find the best people? And how do you use employees' strengths to find the right person for the right position? So. With this, we used a trajectory, and I'm gonna talk about my daughter, Melanie, because she is in self-directed services and is doing it remarkable. But when we tried to decide what kind of an employee she wanted, what did she want in a direct support professional, we were able to use this tool to talk about what she wants in an employee and what she doesn't want. And um, with my daughter, Melanie, she's very upbeat, very happy. She likes to wear sparkly shoes. She likes to have her nails painted and her hair done. Um, and so she would not want an employee who was very quiet and just wanted to sit around. Um, an employee would also have to like animals because in our household we have several and I hope you can't hear the one that's scratching at the door right now. So, but in self-directed services, when you're hiring your employees and you're interviewing them, you are setting the distinguishing what you want in an employee. So it's different than an agency who's not finding an employee that works directly for you. You are actually the one interviewing and trying to determine who will be the best staff. So you can have the um, must haves when you're interviewing, the things that are required, such as CPR first aid certification. Um, you can, they have to have a clean background check. And then you can also add other must haves to your list of what you want in an employee, such as CMT certification, so that they could give medication during their work hours. So this is just a tool that can be used and every support broker has different tools that they use and to help you with your interviewing and hiring of staff and finding the best people and using the strengths to find the right person for the right position. Um, currently, my daughter's one of my daughter's favorite uh, direct support professionals also has the love of everything that she has. When you see them, they both have their nails done. 
They're both in bright colored tie dyed shirts. Um, when they pull in the driveway, you can hear the music jamming because they're both listening to loud music. So we know we've found the right employee uh, when, when all those things are happening. So, um, and with this, I want to note that as a support broker, I have not yet had to help anyone develop a plan to fire anyone. So we have found some really quality, quality direct support professionals through the interview process. And, and uh, so that's really great. That's good. Next slide, please. Yes. So a support broker can help you decide what you want to say in your help wanted ad and what questions to ask in an interview. Um, they'll help you learn what's appropriate and legally allowed. A lot of people don't know that when they put an ad in the paper or on Facebook or at care.com that there are certain things you cannot put in the ad. You cannot ask how old someone is. You cannot ask what their religion is. And uh, so a support broker can guide you with that and help you write up the correct ad and put things in it that help you find the best person. Um, for example, here we put that uh, these are just two ads and one's okay and one's mm, you wouldn't want to do that. If you're trying to hire staff, you're not going to just say, I want someone to work with me. Mm, that's not giving anybody any information. So you want to talk about what qualities you want. Uh, you want someone highly energetic, upbeat, busy, willing to go here, there, and everywhere someone who will respect a person's individual choices and have patience as decisions are made. Um, anyone who knows my daughter Mel knows that she takes a long time to answer, but uh, we need to give her that time. So she definitely wants a direct support professional that can wait. They need to be able to assist when she's working, learn about her health care needs, assist with hygiene routines, ambulation and transfers, we put that they must have CPR first aid certification, a clean background check, and own their own vehicle. Also, the pay rate with the hours in it. So that's an okay ad. It could certainly be developed to look better, and it would be individualized based on what qualities uh, a person was looking for. And then as you're interviewing, you could questions like, what are some of your strengths that make you the best person for this job? That's okay to ask, but you cannot ask how old someone is. So a support broker can help you while you're developing those questions and your help wanted ads. Next slide, please. A support broker can help you with the hiring process. They can help you learn how to review and submit new hire paperwork to the FMS. They're going to let you know what forms are needed. They're going to help you make sure that they're filled out completely and correctly. If they're going to make sure you have a way to submit them to the FMS because once an employee fills them out, they have to go to the FMS to be um, put through the background check and entered into their system and given clearance to work. You might not have a computer that you can do that with, but you might need help getting a scanning app on your phone. That's certainly something that a support broker can coach and guide you with. We can help you download the app, learn to use it, make checklists. Um, so basically, we're, we're able to support in a lot of ways. Next slide. A support broker can help you develop a schedule for your employees. We're going to help you as you look at how many employees you have, how many hours is approved in your plan, what positions each individual going to be in, and when are your scheduled activities. So this is just a sample. Um, we know that the person has 28 hours weekly of personal supports. They have respite. They have uh, 24 hours of community development or community learning services and we just kind of plugged in when they were going to be doing each activity and what service it was going to be and the gray block is the full-time employee um, so this is something that a support broker can help you with and every support broker has different tools that they can help you um, with all of these needs so this is just one example of what a daily schedule might look like next slide mm -hmm. A support broker can help you develop tools to keep track of what you're doing and what your employees are doing every day. So this is just a sample and um, this lets an employee check off what they've done that day so that when the team goes back to see what all activities a person has been doing, um, they have a daily log that's kind of letting them know what all was done. It can also um, have HRST information added to it so that if there was a doctor's appointment or a medical emergency, those can all be marked off. 
And this can be individualized per person. Again, it's just everybody has different tools. We're just sharing one. But certainly if this is something that you want, your support broker can help you develop this in a way that's easy for you to use, whether it's on the computer, whether it's paper, whether you use pictures. Um, those are all ways that you know we can help you set up these communication logs or just ways to keep track of your employees and what they're doing. Next slide. A support broker can help you develop tools to evaluate your employees. You want to know how they're doing at their job. What's their attendance like? Do they have good work performance and work ethic? Are they able to work without direct supervision? Are they helping you meet your goals? Uh, whatever's important to you, we can help you develop tools to evaluate your employees and be there with you as you're doing the evaluation. Next slide. A support broker can help you learn how to review your employee's timesheet or electronic time system and your budget statements. We can help you develop a checklist to help you review your employee's timesheets. You can mark off, do they have their name? Was it signed? Um, we can help you however you need to, to make sure that you get the, the timesheets you know, signed and submitted. We can help you look at your budget. We can go over it line by line and say, oh, this item's being used a little faster. I know Monique mentioned that, that as a CCS, they certainly review your budget statement monthly. And a support broker is going to be keeping track of that too. So then we can talk again, is this line items going a little faster? So let's talk about that. And we can help you know how to understand your statement. So next slide, please. Okay, I think that's it. That's it. Um, that's it. I just just wanted to say that there are so many roles that a support broker has they're definitely an essential part of your team and all of these things are that i've talked about may not be things that you need help with you may need help with something else but your support broker is there to help is part of your team and certainly um can be very valuable to have so, thank you, Mary. oh you're welcome thank you and and this information again um is has been is so informative and and encouraging i i think your presentation and monique's as well as samantha's and alicia's it, you know I, I think the great trepidation that individuals might have as well as families in even considering self-direction is the amount of work and the complexity of work and to know that there's such a strong they have such a strong resource in the ccs as well as a support broker should they choose it, it, you know it's got to be encouraging and um, to know that that support is there, making it possible if they're interested in, in pursuing self-direction. So thank you and, and um, thank you. Before we go on though, um, before we move on to Christy, Caroline, could we do the third poll please? Absolutely. Or Donna? Yep, okay, absolutely. thank you. Thank you. So we have our third poll. It's just asking, are you or the person you support receiving services through DDA? All right, we'll give it another second or two. Okay. okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close this poll. Share the results. So we have 75% of responders said yes, 23% said no, and 2% were not sure. Okay, terrific, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. All right, let's move on to the fiscal management services and, and to talk about FMS, we have Christy Colbreth with us here today. Welcome, Christy. Thank you. Yeah, it is an absolute joy to be presenting with all of you, um, these really great presenters. So I'm just really happy to be here today. I'm gonna pull up my notes really quickly. I've lost them, they're there. Um, so fiscal management service are just like Monique mentioned about coordinators of community service, they're a required service for self-direction. So they are, this, um, the fiscal management service or the FMS, it's kind of like a bank. It is chosen by the person and their team to provide support and self-direction. So the FMS pays the payrolls 
and invoices that people who are self-directing approved. We heard a lot uh, today from everyone about their employees and about um, vendor agencies that can provide services. The FMS pays those people and those companies when the person self-directing approves them. Uh, the FMS also keeps track of that money spent and sends reports to the person and their team to help them stay in budget. And Mo Monique and Babette both covered that, uh, that statement. The FMS is the person who, or that's the company that um, sends out those statements every month to people to let them know how they're doing on their budget. Uh, the FMS also helps the person get their employees ready to work. So they make sure that tax paperwork is filed, um, that employee has bright certifications, and that background checks are completed and are clear. Terrific. Um, Christy, as this mm -hmm. title slide it indicates that the, these are the basics, where might where where might people go to get more information and to learn more about the FMS services? There are a lot of places to do that. On our DDA website, there is information available on FMS services. Um, in addition, you can reach out to your coordinator of community service and they'll be able to help you talk to you about the current vendors that provide the service, um, as well as if you've hired a support broker. Those are really great places to learn more. All right, great, thank you. And then with that, we're actually going to move into the um, DDA regional offices, their, their roles and, and how they too will, can support individuals and families to self-direct. And Christy, I know that you're gonna share that information with us. Sure I am, yeah. Um, so the DDA, the Development Disabilities Administration, provides information, assistance, and guidance regarding self-direction and all services. So once you and so once you've met with your team and you've created your plan, you and your CCS submit that PCP to DDA for review. The DDA reviews your person center plan to make sure it follows all the rules of the waiver and meets your needs. The DDA then sends the approved PCP to your team, including your fiscal management service. Uh, we also keep a handbook for people interested in self-direction on our website in both English and Spanish, and it's included today as a resource in today's yeah. webinar. Yeah. Terrific. Well, thank you, Christy, and I, I'm sure we're going to have more questions at the end regarding all of these, uh, all mm -hmm. the information that was shared today. And so with that, let me move on to um, we actually have a slide here for the DDA, the regional um, self-directed leads, their contact information in each of our regional office, as well as the advocacy specialist. Christy, do you want to say something about yeah. the advocacy specialist real quick? Thanks. Definitely. Uh, we also, so I want, can we go back one just really quickly? Oh, sure. Um, I want to focus in on our self-directed leads. They are an excellent resource for people, for CCSs and support brokers. Um, we have these these lead people in our regions focus on self-direction and they're available for support and guidance. So reach out to those folks in the region that you belong to for any support with self-direction. And if, also, if this, now, mm -hmm. can they just reach out to them directly or do they have mm -hmm. to go through their CCS? They can reach out to them directly or they can go through their CCS, whichever okay. makes sense. So we also know that you may want support from someone who's been there. So we can go to the next slide. DDA has advocacy specialists for each of their four regional offices. Each specialist is someone who has their own disability. They have lived experience using the same services that DDA waiver participants do um, and other people with disabilities use, such as Social Security, DOORS, that's the Department of Rehabilitative Services, and paratransit. This gives them insider knowledge on how to navigate services that someone without disabilities may not have. The advocacy specialist can help people who are applying for DDA services, people already receiving DDA services, and their families. Some of the things that uh, self-advocacy specialists can help with are helping to explain what services are available and helping troubleshoot problems, and they are can be available to present to community groups and to teams on topics such as transitioning youth, mental health, and assistive technology. 
these are really excellent resources. So we have their contact information listed for every region. Terrific. Thank you for sharing this. And then with that, let's take a look. Um, we, we, we've listed a couple of resources here for you. Um, the Developmental Disability Administration, as well as their self-directed services handbook in both English and Spanish, as Christy mentioned previously. The DDA regional offices, their um, address, contact numbers, so forth and so on. A listing of the coordinators of community services providers. And of course, the DDA self-advocacy specialists at a glance document. And we, we truly hope you'll avail yourself of these resources and of course, reach out to any of those contacts as you need support or, or information. And with that, that really does conclude our webinar. So we finished a bit early and at this point, we will take questions and we're fortunate to have Rhonda working with us here today, Director of Federal Programs, who's been monitoring the questions and will um, read them out to us. So Rhonda, welcome and thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Marianne, first question to you. Um, a couple of people are noting um, that they um, joined the webinar a little bit late and were curious about the presentation, where they could find it, and would they be able to access the information later? Can you just share how they can access the PowerPoint um, and um, the posting for the webinar? Absolutely. First and foremost, you, you will get the PDF is in the handout section. And then on the DDA website, uh, Maryland Community Practice for Supporting Families webinar series page, our webinars are listed there. And um, they're all archived. And if you have trouble finding it, um, my contact information is, is the last slide of the presentation. You can reach out to me and I can send you the direct link. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Marianne. And, um, Monique, um, this question I'm going to share with you um, as the coordinator of community services that help to support individuals as they're developing their trajectory and facilitating um, those discussions with the team. The question is, how difficult is it to switch to self-direction? How long does it take to get DDA approval? Do you stay with your provider until the process is complete? Do you get enough funds to do what you want to do? Can you share your thoughts related to that, Monique, as your role as the coordinator? Sure, yeah. So um, so if I don't answer all those questions, please let me know. Um, so the process to switch over, um, I think, depends on your perspective. Um, I think in my perspective, it's, it's pretty easy. Within our systems, um, we use a system called LTSS, and we just click a little box that says you're going to self-direct your services within your person-centered plan. So it's an option in your person-centered plan when we're writing that to say that you're going to self-direct your services. And then we work with you if you have an interest in self-directing your services to identify what supports you want, what support people you want in your plan. If you want a support broker, you know, then we're going to um, provide you with a list of support brokers, maybe um, start interviewing some of the support brokers so that you can get that person on your team as well and decide how you want to move forward with your plan. Um, the switch over to have it approved kind of depends on the speed at which you want it to occur and um, need it to occur and also have kind of everything in place for it to happen. Um, I would say uh, the quickest, you know, you have to be able to write a person-centered plan revision and get all components involved, write a draft, have a PCP meeting, um, have your team members present for that meeting, um, identify all the services, the outcomes, and still submit that to DDA within their time frame to allow them to review it and approve it. So I would say minimally for PCP revisions, I would say approximately two months, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter if there's an emergency situation. Um, so, it, so it really, really depends. Um, and then you would continue to use your current provider until your service um, plan ends. So for example, if you do a person-centered plan revision where you're switching over to self-directed that is effective July 1st, you would continue with all of your current services until June 30th. And then as of July 1st, you would switch over to your self-directed services plan. 
um, if, if you don't mind, I just would like to interject. First of all, thank you, Monique. And I just want um, folks to know that we are planning because of an increased interest on the part of individuals currently in service, in traditional services and interested moving to self-direction, we are planning a webinar on that, um, on that aspect and, and how that transition takes place and what it looks like. And we're planning, we're hoping to do this in June. The, the date is still to, to be determined, but um, stay tuned and we will address that. So thank you. Thank you, Monique. Great. Did I get all you. aspects of that question? Yep, I, I think we're good. Thank you. Um, so the next question, um, Bobette, I'm gonna um, ask you to share your thoughts as a support broker who um, you know, can help to support the participant and inform the team of options. And the question is, how can health insurance be used for staff benefits? That's a great question. And something that I'm seeing more of that people want to put into their budget for their employees. Um, health insurance can be reimbursed um, if an individual or if an employee has health insurance and they're paying it, it can be put in the plan to help cover some of that by reimbursing them. Uh, there is a process that has to be followed through to get them reimbursed, but it's certainly something that is starting to be used more. Um, it's become a valuable asset to working for someone in um, self-directed services. So and I think for the exact process, you know, we need a little more information. We'd have to talk a little bit more about it, but it is something that is available and definitely worth checking into. Great, thank you. And, and um, as part of that self-directed budget that Monique and others were talking about, one of the line item options includes health insurance. So it is an item that can be explored. So uh, Monique, um, we also have a question about how many hours are allocated for support broker services? Can you talk about that team approach and process to look at people's assessed needs for support broker hours um, and, and information related to the ability to get additional hours authorized by the DDA? So the current limit is four hours per month. Um, Previously, like a year and a half ago, that, that that's kind of a new limit within, I'd say, the year and a, last year and a half to two years. Um, and so it's four hours per month. If an individual has um, a need to have more than four hours of services from a support broker per month, we just have to explain why they have that need. So let's say perhaps they have. Um, four or five staff that have timesheets, a lot of timesheets to be processed and reviewed. And the support broker helps them to use that checklist that Babette was talking about to review those timesheets. You know, that could be a reason that we explain why there is additional service hours needed. Um, and um, yeah, and so, so if, you know, if anything, anytime that we need more than what's a service limit allowed in the service limit, um, there are certain circumstances where we can ask DDA to exceed that limit, but we do have to have a good reason. And it has to be a reason that DDA either sets forth for that reason or that they also agree um, is a reason to need that, those additional services. Great, Monique, thank you for sharing that. Um, you talked about um, in some of the efforts with developing the person center plan, you referred to the service implementation plan, right? And so the service implementation plan is the specific kind of plan or services that, you know, staff would be implemented for the participant or if a vendor or provider was hired, what would be the scope of the services that they're providing, how they're going to provide that service to support participants? Um, and we know in DDA's policy um, for support so, um, service implementation plan, it talks about people who are self-directing that the participant or their designated representative creates that service implementation plan for their staff. And then if they hire a vendor or provider, then that vendor or provider could create that to be submitted to the participant for the review. So the question that came in was, I'm a support broker. I was told by the CCS that it's my responsibility to complete the service implementation plan. Is that true? Um, 
I think that per perhaps um, a team conversation would be best suited on how to address that service implementation plan. Um, there might be a specific criteria that the CCS is, is thinking that the support broker can provide, um, you know, without having knowledge of kind of what that particular circumstance is. Um, you know, I can't say for sure, um, but, but as, you know, we said before, the team communication and collaboration is incredibly important. And the support broker has such a huge role um, that it would be, um, beneficial to have input from the support broker in some situations in completing a service implementation plan. Is it the support broker's primary responsibility or sole responsibility to complete a service implementation plan? No, it's the individual's um, primary responsibility to complete that or the designated representative, guardian, um, you know, it, but, you know, the team has to really make sure um, it's, it's best when the team works together to complete that. Great, thank you. And, you know, today we heard, you know, a lot of um, great information about the different resources that your team can be, the support broker, advocacy specialist, CCS, FMS, the family members and teams. And Alicia, you talked about the team strategy and how important it was to really look at the team and, and the benefits of that. So we had a question that came in that says, um, how do some self-directed participants overcome the limited experiences of team members and self-direction to be able to adequately advise and help them. From your perspective, do you have any thoughts about how participants can overcome limited experiences from their team members to help support them? Sure. Um, one of the things that, um, that a lot of teams do is um, use an experienced staff or team member to train um, a newcomer. Um, and that is perfectly allowable if it's in your plan to overlap for a few hours so that you can have somebody who's knowledgeable about the goings on, uh, do some additional training for a newcomer, as well as you know different participants. I think Sam probably can speak to this better, but she knows exactly what she wants and a participant who knows exactly what they want and um, or who needs help in, in expressing that um, again, the participant should be the, the main um, reason, uh, the main provider of the information for a new, a new trainee. And oftentimes I find new people come in with, without uh, knowledge to overcome and they don't have a way they've always done it. Um, and they're very open to hearing um, either ways that it has been done and in oftentimes um, and in a good way, come up with new and different things um, to do or new and different ways to do a task. So I would highly encourage somebody if the if the personality fit is there, um, if the care is there, that training people uh, can absolutely happen with either current staff, participant, or any of the advocates that um, that help the person. Great, thank you. So. Um, I'm gonna go back to Monique, another question about um, services and it's regarding requesting one-to-one -one staff ratio. And it's asking whether there was documentation needed required to justify, let's say a two-to-one or, two, or one-to-one -one staff ratio. Um, and what kind of documents or assessments would be necessary for those requests? Uh, so it depends on the services that you're asking for. Uh, for the need for one-to-one -one services. But yes, there are documents that are going to be required um, or not necessarily, there, there, there needs to be supporting what I call evidence um, to justify the need for that designated one-to-one -one or two-to-one staff um, in, because those rates uh, tend to be a little bit higher. So if we're talking about like community development services, the, um, the kind of go-to is a group rate, which is a one-to-four rate. And then in order to qualify for the one-to-one -one community development services rate, a person does have to have a health risk, a health risk screening tool score of, I, I don't have the service definitions in front of me and I always reference them before I give a like direct answer, but I wanna say it's a four for their HRST. 
um, and or a behavior support plan that indicates a need for one-to-one -one for health and safety reasons. So one of those two can be used for supporting evidence for needing a one-to-one -one for community development services. So that's just an example, but the service definitions through DDA's website under their providing provider billing documentation guidelines, um, it references all of the requirements needed for that one-to-one -one or two-to-one staffing, and your coordinator can help you find that as well. Thank you. Marianne, I'm gonna ask this question, um, I'm sending this question to you. So this sure. is from a, a parent, and the parent's saying that um, my son will be transitioning from a residential school and needs to receive residential services after he transitions. Can we consider self-direction for him? So any advice for parents um, as they're looking at supporting their loved ones transitioning in terms of looking at services and service options and, and thoughts from your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for the question. It's a great one. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, we live in a time, I don't think there's ever been a better time in history for people with intellectual and developmental disability in terms of the supports and services they can utilize or tap into um, and integrated supports and services at that. So I think the question is, what is the vision? What, what first and foremost, what is his or her vision for their life? What is your vision for their life? What is What are those things that he or she needs um, and, and would that work better in a residential um, traditional setting? Or could you do that through a self-directed model? And it, but it means sitting down and really thinking it through and really brainstorming around all that's needed to support him or her. And then you can, then it's up to you to make that choice. Um, yeah. And, and um, Rhonda, I don't know if you wanna add anything else to that or not, or Alicia or Sam, but I, I think, yeah, you, you first begins with your vision and figuring out what that is and what's important to them and for them and what they need in order to live. And then you you begin to you know choose a, a service delivery model. Yeah, Marion, I think that is the so key that we try to remind people that um, we are very fortunate that in Maryland, we have um, these programs that offer a variety of services, but before getting too focused on services, we really need to know where we're going. And that's really finding out what that trajectory is um, what the good life, what the outcomes and goals of that person, what they're trying to achieve. And from that, then we can see what kind of supports maybe are missing that we can we can support them with. And um, I think that's so true. Sam, I got a question for you. Um, we've got a couple questions that are coming in and, and some people are trying to figure out, um, you know, it sounds like that you hire people and that you spend most of the day just with that one person. Um, so meaning that people's lives are just, you know, potentially could be just with their direct support staff. Can you talk about your supports and your life um, and um, what you do? Are, are, is your day completely with your staff only? How, how do you, how do you um, see your life and your trajectory? Uh, so talk about your days. My days? Uh, yeah, you work. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, my days have been very good. Um, there are days that I am really busy with my baking and my other activities. And then there are times I'm not so busy and I've just been, you know, been on, um, been recharging and that's on the TV, on my computer, playing on my Nintendo Switch um, and stuff. And then um, that's how it usually is. And when I get orders, um, it's usually just regular orders and I'm easy and I can easily handle it. But if it's big orders, then I get like, okay, I need help. I need my big helper, which is my mom like to be called for, <laughs> for her work. And, but yeah, my days have been good, successful and all that. Great. Thank um, you, Sam. So, and to the, tomorrow is usually my day of going to the library, but um, like I go Tuesdays and Thursdays, 10 to noon, but there are times I can't come in because I have baking orders. So I have to call in and they tell me it's okay. We, we love you and all that. We know you got a successful baking business <laughs> and all that. So they love me. They're not going to get rid of me. 
<laughs> Great. So it sounds like your life is rich with um, your own business and supports that maybe you're receiving from your staff you hired. But in addition, you have your own time to recharge and you're also working at the library and doing other things. So your life is, is full of different options and opportunities. At times you have support from your staff, but other times you do things that you wanna do with your friends and your family. Yep, exactly. Great. Alicia, um, here's a question for you from a family member. It says, how burdensome to the family parent is self-directed services? Frankly, this is what scares me. Can you talk about the family parents um, perspective and supports that are available to you? Sure. Um, I have heard that before myself. Um, I think as a family member um, who wants the best for the person, no matter which um, method they choose, provider or uh, self-direction, you're gonna be spending some time. Um, uh, and most people, I think it's not really a, a burden. Um, you do have help of a CCS and, and if you choose of a support broker who can um, be a very big help and relieve and burdens that you uh, might feel. But for anything, you definitely would use some advocacy uh, for the person because family members often, especially in the beginning, know the person best um, and can advocate for them, but the team together would help um, decide what responsibilities fall where, what the participant can do, what a family member might choose to do, what the support broker and the CCS uh, might choose to do. I feel like people who um, choose the provider method, their families also are involved. They're involved in making sure that the life of, a, of the person and the provider is a happy one that the person-centered plan is a good one, that it's being executed correctly um, to the best of everybody's ability. So, you know, when we love someone, um, we're invested in it. Um, I don't know that it's that much worse or worse at all, but if you're concerned about it, I think you just need to build a big team, um, uh, be thoughtful about how much uh, time you can spend because, you know, parents of, of people in self-direction do work full-time jobs. You'll need to have some backup if somebody calls in sick. So I think with, with thought, it doesn't have to be more so. Um, try not to let it scare you because the benefits, um, depending on the person, um, can far outweigh any of the difficulties. For example, in our family, my son would not be happy being at a place from this time to this time doing the things that they're doing or that they've managed to make person-centered for him um that would be a not a happy existence for him and therefore not for us so um i think we've been lucky to hire staff who know and care for our son so the turnover is less than it may be in another situation so t I, i'm a big person of a, a t-square where you look the positives and negatives of of the choices down um, and see where it's where it fits for the person. But um, I hope that helps. I hope that helps. And also, uh, Estan has a Facebook page with all sorts of people who self-direct. Um, you can pick the brains of others who have similar circumstances to you um, and get even more feedback about your concerns. I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Alicia. As a, another one along those lines from a family member, it says, so a family would have to get used to having the employee around for hours every day, correct? Can you share your experience with the supports that, that Al's getting and what he does and how that impacts your home and, and your, sure. your family? Yeah, so um, for us, it will depend on the day. There are some days where Al has a plan, you can tell. He gets out of bed, gets dressed, and he's like telling or pointing and um, Zoom, they're off. And they may be gone for hours and hours doing various things. I usually get check-ins, um, pictures either from Al or from his staff about what they're doing and where they are. Um, there are other days where that is not his jam. And so they are around. Um, they are around maybe all day some days. Um, but to me, that's the beauty of the self-direction thing. Um, he's doing what he wants to do. Um, so 
it does take a little getting used to to have somebody around. Of course, it depends on what your home looks like, whether there's spaces, you know, individualized spaces um, for people to do things and where a person prefers to do them. So um, there is an ability to have privacy, certainly for Al to have his thing going on and me to have my thing going on. Um, so, but, but there definitely are people in your home um, the amount of which really depends, I think, on the participant himself. Great, thank you. Monique, here's a question for you. Where does one find the support broker? Um, so there are a few different ways that you can find a support broker. Um, on the DDA self-directed website, there is a link for you to click for all of the support brokers that are approved by DDA for uh, throughout the state. And it's like um, kind of like an Excel spreadsheet. It says what counties they work in and it has all their contact information. And so you can start there. Um, you can look to see it's it's separated by region so it'll have eastern central western um, and you can look in your region to see if they support your county and then you can start um, making a list of who you might want to contact um, depending on your service coordinator um, they may have um, already kind of separated this list i've taken that list from the self-direction website and I have uh, created a list of all support brokers that support the county that I'm in, which is in Washington County. Um, and then I have reached out to the support brokers to see who are accepting referrals. So um, when I have somebody who's switching to, when I support somebody who's switching to self-direction, I can um, access the list that I kind of keep maintenance of and say, here are the people that are in that service Washington County, who are currently accepting referrals, who, who have, or I should say, who have let me know they're currently accepting referrals. Um, and so I usually reference both the list from the self-directed website, as well as the ones that I know who have responded and said they're accepting referrals. Um, and then I also provide them with the information, the self-directed website uh, through DDA's site is, is excellent too because it has the support broker interview questions that an individual can ask a support broker for that interview um, and some really helpful um, tools that, that are available as well. So, so that's how you would begin the support broker interview process and you can have your service coordinator uh, or CCS, um, you can ask them for as much help as you need in that process. Great, thank you Monique. Um, and just to add to that, the DDA is establishing a new provider directory. It's going to be a web-based directory um, that's a little dynamic that will be available um, on our website. Um, and we're going to include the support brokers in that directory so that you can type in your, your county and some parameters of what you're looking at, and it'll provide that information so you don't have to try to do spreadsheets and things like that. So we're really excited about that. Christy, can you tell us, are DDA approved agencies allowed to be the support broker and provide the needed services under self-direction? That's a good question. So um, to be a support broker in Maryland, you have to have a couple of certifications as an individual. Uh, the DDA provides training for that certification that lasts for about two years, for two years. Um, so on the DDA training website, you will find um, support broker training there. Um, in addition, support brokers are required to maintain first aid and CPR certification. Now in Maryland, there are a lot of support brokers who provide a service by themselves. They are themselves the support broker. There are also a couple companies in Maryland who have several support brokers that they employ who provide the service. Both are um, both are great models. We like both. We think that pe it gives people the most choice. Um, so agencies can employ support brokers and do it that way, but being an agency does not automatically make you able to provide support brokerage. I hope that makes sense. Yep. Thank you, Christy. Bobette, here's a question. Okay, I'm sorry, Rhonda. Let's just take one more question because we still have two more polls we need to take. And that would um, we take one question, do the two polls, and then I think we'll be able to get out on time. 
Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, this Thank question you. is for Bobette um, as a support broker. Um, the question is, is the person allowed to hire independent contractors or would all hired staff be W-2 employees? That is a really good question. And that depends mainly on the service they're providing. Um, people can have both employees and vendors working for them. Employees, of course, are going to get taxes taken out and have W-2s. Contractors are going to get W-9s at the end of the year with just the total amount of money they've made. Um, and that is individualized per service and per who you're hiring. Well, Babette, thank you. And I, I want to thank all of you. I'd like to take a moment to, we have two more tolls, tolls, I'm sorry, it, the toll on you to complete the polls. If, if you wouldn't mind taking the time to complete um, our next two polls, I'd greatly appreciate that. And Caroline, can you bring them up for us, please? Thank you. Absolutely. So the first one is, were you satisfied with this webinar? Okay, so we're going to give it another few seconds. Okay, we share the results. So we had 2% who said they were not satisfied, 42% who said they were satisfied, and 56% who said they were greatly satisfied. So we can go on to our last poll. So depending on the topic, will you attend future webinars? We'll give it another few seconds. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and share the results. We had 96% of participants say yes and 4% say maybe. So that was our last poll, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Caroline. And again, I wanna thank all of you for joining us today, but in particular, I'd like to thank Samantha, Alicia and Al, as well as Babette and Monique and Christy and Rhonda, thank you for um, monitoring and, and reading the questions. And of course, I want to take the time to thank Deputy Secretary Bernie Simons for making all of this possible. And um, I wanna welcome you and invite you to join us for our next webinar on self-direction, moving from traditional services to self-directed services with the date to be determined. Um, with that, we say goodbye. And oh, here is my contact information. If um, I can help in any way, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, otherwise, have a wonderful day and take care. Bye-bye. Thank you all. We'll be ending the webinar. Thank you, Caroline.